Hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome to my channel. My name is Paul, the Canadian Snowman, here once again with another awesome history video. Uh, yeah, they're doing Origins of Germanic Tribes. It's a Barbarians documentary, uh, right? <laughs> uh, I just call my, call my eyes because I've seen the the TV show Barbarians. It's been a few months since I've seen it, but it was a it was a really good. Uh, it's not, you know, it's not a documentary, but, you know, it's a TV show. I thought it was really good, like, you know. If you guys kind of like, you know, stuff like Game of Thrones, you know, just come with, well, it's not, really, it's not fantasy or anything, but, you know, if you like that, those, you know, those medieval kind of times kind of uh, TV shows, definitely check this one out. It is really cool, you know. Uh, but, yeah, I guess this, t I guess this is kind of, um, basically, this is a documentary of that of the same time period that, uh, you know, whatever the TV show was. <laughs> uh, so yeah, I don't know. Let's check it out guys. I'm not exactly sh ex sure what to expect, but anything, you know, you know, I'm, I'm kind of curious more what gets Duran to barbarians and stuff like that. So let's check it out guys and see what we have to offer. Please hit that like and subscribe button below. I really appreciate it. And yeah. If you guys know what movie I'm talking about, definitely uh, let me know in the comments. That'd be great. No! Dang it. Skip. All right. Of the so-called barbarians the Romans did battle with over the centuries, none have made as lasting an impact on the history of Europe as the Germanic peoples. They terrorized the empire for centuries before conquering its western half in 476. Okay, uh, I thought we, I was I thought there was like for some reason I was like Germanic tribes, you know, and like kind of barbarians they were kind of separating from. I guess I kind of didn't read the title right. And I was like, isn't the Germanic tribes, aren't they, aren't they kind of considered barbarians, you know? Like everyone kind of outside of the Roman Empire to the north, weren't they pretty much considered barbarians? So anyways. AD, arguably ending, covering its western half in 476 AD. Arguably ending the era of antiquity and ushering in the Middle Ages. In this... Yeah, I was going to say, too, like, that year, isn't that kind of like when Rome's kind of on the down, uh, the downside, and, you know, things kind of start falling apart, like the Golden Age is kind of gone, and things start, yeah, apparently so. Ending the era of antiquity, and ushering in the Middle Ages. In this video, we will shine the spotlight on them, exploring their culture and society, while telling the history of the earliest origins of the ancient Germanic peoples, the greatest enemy of Rome. Like, look at like, all these different kind of wars here. I wonder if, I'm, man, they might have these out already. I wonder if uh, Kings of Generals is playing on or has done any of these kind of wars here. They'd be kind of cool to, you know how like, we had like Caesar's kind of a step-by-step -step process of kind of his whole life of kind of leading uh, Rome and kind of into like, this, I don't know, conquering a lot more land and stuff like that. Uh, and I wonder if like you can have like, I don't know if there's enough information out there to where they can kind of do a series on the Germanic tribes kind of slowly taking over, you know, Rome and stuff and if there's like heroes on the germanic side that you can kind of follow that'd be kind of really cool to see shout out to netflix and its new historical tv series barbarians for sponsoring this video barbarians is a brand new tv series set in antiquity with the backdrop of the famous battle of teutoburg forest in which the legions of the roman empire led by publius quinctilius yeah did this series is awesome i think they only have one i mean i need to check to see if they have a second season out by now but I know I've only, I've only seen one season, so maybe they have a second season out. Or they, it might only be like a one season uh, TV series. But yeah, if you're new, if you like this kind of stuff, check it out. It's really good. Julius Varus are ambushed by the alliance of Germanic tribes led by the former Roman auxilia Arminius. 
this dramatization of the events of 9 AD is everything history fans were asking for for years, with awesome production quality, attention to detail, historiosity, and great actors. The characters speak Latin and German only, making the show truly atmospheric. We have been clamoring for historical movies and TV shows to return to our screens, and Netflix is giving us just that. So we'd be watching this great new show even without being sponsored. Streaming it is the best way to show how much we as a historical community care about seeing more historical dramas made. So stream it on Netflix if you're subscribed, or subscribe to stream it if you're not. So who was... Yeah, I, normally like commercials like that, I would skip ahead. But yeah, that that you guys you guys obviously know what I'm talking about now. It's really good. Definitely check it out. And it would be kind of I love this old school TV series like that. So yeah, the more the merrier because I binge watch that stuff. Man, I watched that whole series in two days. But anyways, yeah. Anyways, back on to uh, the uh, yeah the original programming. Were the ancient Germanic peoples. In short, they were a collection of Iron Age tribes that lived in the rugged forests west and north of the Rhine and Danube rivers during mid to late antiquity. Best known for their long and complicated relationship with the Roman Empire, with whom they traded, integrated with, and most importantly, made war on. Broadly speaking, they are ancestrally related to many peoples in Europe today including the Dutch, Swiss, Austrians, Flemish, Swedes, Norwegians, Danes, and of course, the modern Germans, all of whom are speakers of modern Germanic dialects. In 98 AD, the historian Tacitus completed a book titled De Origine et Situ Germanorum, more commonly known as Germania, a Roman survey of the history and culture of their Germanic foes. This tome provides us with the most valuable window into Germanic culture, and will be referred to throughout this video. Let us begin with a quote. Undivided Germany is separated from the Gauls, Rhaetians and Pannonians by the rivers Rhine and Danube, from the Sarmatians and Dacians by mutual fear of mountains, and the rest of it is surrounded by ocean. As for the Germans themselves, I should suppose them to be native to the area, who would have left Asia or Africa or Italy to look for Germany? With its wild scenery and harsh climate, it is pleasant neither to live in nor look upon unless it be one's home. As condescending as his account is, Tacitus was not entirely incorrect. By his time, the various Germanic tribes had been living in their traditional territories for at least a millennium or two. However, their true origins are a little more complex than the chronicler suggests, and the key to understanding it lies in linguistics. The Germanic languages are part of the Indo-European linguistic family, and therefore share a common ancestor with almost all of the languages of Europe, Northern India, and Western Asia. As of now, the leading idea is the Kurgan hypothesis which postulates that the Proto-Indo-European language was spoken by a nomadic Europid people who inhabited the Pontic steppe from at least the 6th millennium BC. Wow. Known titularly as the Kurgan people, or alternatively the Yamnaya, they were hardy seasonal livestock herders and were probably among the first humans to domesticate the wild horse, first as food and later as transportation. Around the 4th millennium BC, these pastoralists are said to have utilized the advantage given to them by their four-legged friends to expand out of their steppe homeland and across a huge swath of the Eurasian landmass, displacing or intermixing with the indigenous peoples already living there. Over many centuries, the Proto-Indo-European tongue spoken by these various branches of Yamnaya migrants gave rise to the early versions of Greek, Latin, Sanskrit, and of course, German. Proto-Germanic languages and cultures were said to have emerged as a distinct branch of Indo-European during the Bronze Age, contained to the northern coast of modern Germany, the Jutland Peninsula, and the southern tip of Sweden. In the late Iron Age, they expanded from the Rhine to the Vistula rivers, bordering the Celtic peoples to the west and the Scytho-Sarmatian horse lords to the east. Early Germanic society was predominantly rural. Unlike their Proto-Indian European ancestors, 
they mostly lived sedentary lives in small to mid-sized villages. The economy of these villages revolved mainly around the rearing of goats, sheep and cattle, and the cultivation of grain. Ample lush wilderness meant that hunting and foraging played a significant role in their lifestyle as well. They were never a single nation, and instead a spectrum of many independent tribes with similar but differing cultures and languages. Among these were larger confederations, like the Swebi, Marcomanni and Alamanni, and the political map of... Like, that, I guess that would make sense how, like, basically, uh, like, Rome was able to kind of, like, conquer it. It's because they aren't all just under, you know, one or, you know, together, you know. And so it's a lot easier for, like, a colossus like Rome to kind of just pick them off one by one because they'd be kind of, you know... The rivalries amongst each other, you know, would kind of prevent them from kind of becoming one and fighting back and kind of thing. But, you know, I guess, you know, enough's enough, you know, eventually, right? Ancient Germania was... I just also think it's cool how far back, like, when, like, 6,000 BC, just how, you know, how everything's kind of entwined together. I think that's really cool. Marcomanni and Alamanni and the political map of ancient Germania was ever-shifting as independent factions splintered out of larger tribes, larger tribes swallowed up smaller tribes, and loosely organized alliances came together and fell apart. With the timeless protection of ADT, it's safe to say... Hey, hey Google, skipping. unlock the front door. But, as one can imagine, these factions were all highly martial in nature. Tacitus claimed that while kingship in Germania was determined by bloodline, it was the subordinate war leaders who were the real power in their tribe. In turn, the war leaders only remained in power as long as they could continue to deliver victories for their people, and were promptly ousted if they showed cowardice or incompetence. Let us now expand on what this warrior culture looks like. Unlike the chariot riders of Gaul to their west, and the mounted archers of Sarmatia to their east, the ancient Germanic peoples possessed little to no cavalry, as horses were a symbol of luxury reserved for kings and nobles. As such, Germanic armies were made predominantly of infantry. Quality metal was a luxury so iron panoply was reserved for tribal leaders and their inner circle. The common warrior was usually clad only in linen or leather, and naked from the waist up. They wielded javelins, lances, and short spears, called framea, which required comparatively less iron to forge. They protected themselves with long, oval or rectangular shields, in which was embedded a hard iron shield boss, which could be used to bash the enemy to deal blunt force damage. However, what the Germanic peoples lacked in equipment, they made up with ferocious and fearless fighting. Tacitus remarked on their stigma of spinelessness with grim commentary. Traitors and deserters are hung from trees, cowards and poor fighters are plunged into the mud of the marshes with a hurdle over their heads. Despite the bellicose nature of the Germanic peoples, there were avenues for non-violent diplomacy among them. The most prominent of these were the great intertribal gatherings known as hustings, or simply as the thing. According to Tacitus, these assemblies would take place only when the moon was neither new nor full. The summoned tribes would arrive, and once there they would take their seats while girded with their weapons. Kings and chiefs would speak one by one, in order of importance based on age, birthright, and battles won. As the leaders made various proposals, the crowd would groan loudly if they disapproved, and clash their spears enthusiastically if they approved. It was through gatherings like these that issues of land rights and resource distribution were settled, and political alliances were created among tribes. Tacitus also mentions the role of priests during these gatherings, who acted as powerful mediators between tribes, with the authority to force obedience to keep the peace. Let us use this as a... 
that's really cool how they kind of get in depth on how like everything works and stuff like that and how the tribes kind of made decisions together and uh and not just kind of like i guess one person go from town to town i guess and try to convince the people to do one certain thing and they all get together and basically come together as for a common goal and uh yeah cool stuff the authority to force obedience to keep the peace. Let us use this as a segue to discuss the nature and role of religion in early Germanic society. Please do. By far the best known variant of Germanic paganism lies in the mythology of the Viking Age, which was adhered to by the Norsemen in the early medieval era, even as the rest of their Germanic cousins eventually adopted Latin Christianity. However, we should not assume that Norse paganism one second. Who was texting me? And in the early medieval era, even as the rest of their Germanic cousins eventually adopted Latin Christianity. However, we should not assume that Norse paganism was the exact same as the rites practiced by their ancestral relatives of antiquity. After all, they were separated by over 700 years. Yeah. With that said, anyone familiar with the Viking pantheon would certainly find some familiar faces among the gods of the Swabi, Alamanni, and Makamani. On the subject of Germanic, yeah, I, 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 show, I, I do see uh, like some similarities between like, like Vikings and the Germanic tribes. Uh, I, I guess that kind of makes sense considering like the Vikings come from like the north and they're kind of just underneath, you know. So I guess all that, them intertwining together, I guess makes sense at all if there's a lot of similarities faith tacitus had this to say of the gods they worship mercury the most to whom on certain days they count even the sacrifice of human life lawful hercules and mars they appease with animal life as is permissible the deities the roman historian mentions are distinctly olympian in nature but Tacitus was actually drawing parallels between native Germanic gods and the Greco-Roman pantheon. Mercury, in this case, was Wodenaz, an early form of Odin, thus associated as both he and Mercury were messengers for the gods and guides between the mortal world and the afterlife. Hercules was probably Donna, who, like the ancient Greek hero, was a great warrior, adventurer, and beast slayer. His mighty hammer was associated with Hercules' club. As one might have guessed, Donna was an early form of Thor. Meanwhile, Mars was equated to... I was thinking that, hold on a second, like, wouldn't that person be called Thor? And, but then I didn't want to feel like, well, feel dumb for, like, a saying that, but they brought it up so good, I don't feel, I don't feel dumb for her anymore, so... Awesome! Because, you know, Thor... That was an early right? form of Thor. Meanwhile, Mars was equated to Tyr, a minor deity by the time of the Viking Age, but a highly important patron of war and wisdom during antiquity. Although Tacitus compared him to the Roman god of war, he was most likely derived from the Proto-Indo-European Deus, the same god from which the Greek Zeus and Roman Jupiter evolved from. So while it is easy to dismiss Tacitus's rebranding of the Germanic gods into Roman ones, they were actually more interconnected than most realize. Not referenced by Tacitus, but found in the archaeological records, are other aspects of Germanic mythology, including the proto-versions of the goddess of love, beauty and fertility Freya, and Yggdrasil, the world tree. We know very little about how the German peoples carried out their religious rites, but according to Tacitus, human sacrifice appears to have been practiced. Ancient bodies found in the bogs of northern Germany show evidence of ritual slaughter. Ta I'm kind of curious because like, we just did like the Mayans and stuff like that, and like they do like sac a lot of sacrifices, uh, and you know, and so it's kind of curious like who who do they sacrifice? Do they sacrifice the weak and everything? Because like they said, you know, if you're like traitor or whatnot they're going to kill you but that doesn't mean they're going to sacrifice maybe you're the sacrifice because it doesn't seem like it'd be like a very that like the gods would want somebody like that so i wonder if they do like the like higher end like the nobles and stuff like that like kind of like in the mayan time 
are, are the ones that get sacrificed or are they just kind of, I don't know, the choosing of who they sacrifice, I think it would be kind of interesting if they knew that. Uh, but yeah, it's definitely cool how these different areas like Rome and then Germanic and the Vikings have the religions are kind of connected, which makes sense because over the years, you know, people travel and whatnot. And so, yeah, it definitely makes sense there. So anyways, I think this is really neat. And the bogs of northern Germany show evidence of ritual slaughter. Tacitus also claimed that Germanic priests read divinations based on the flight patterns of birds, the casting of runes written on tree bark, and the behavior of sacred white horses never soiled by mortal use. Meanwhile, two golden horns found in southern Denmark feature engravings of dancing warriors adorned in horned helmets. This likely depicts some form of a seasonal cycle, where ceremonies were held according to the transition between spring, summer, autumn, and winter. Okay, because I always wondered, like, where the horn helmets really come from with the Vikings? Because we just did, I've done a series on the Vikings, definitely check it out. Uh, and from one part of me, I always, I always thought, like, uh, that's just like a symbolism kind of thing, like, the, there's, I never thought they'd actually like just all together travel with these horn bite horn helmets. But if it's kind of like part of like a like a ritual, you know, they have the horn helmets on. It's only for like the temporary kind of thing. That would definitely make sense and uh, definitely understandable. Like where that thought came of, you know, where the visual of you know all Vikings wearing horn horned helmets. These were held according to the transition between spring, summer, autumn, and winter. It is here that we will delve into the Germanic people's interactions with the Roman world, a multi-layered, centuries-long relationship that would, in time, come to define the fate of both cultures. For centuries, it was the Celtic peoples that stood as a buffer between Germania and Rome, but by the late 2nd century BC, the long struggle between the Gallic tribes and the growing Republic had begun to turn in the latter's favour. By 118 BC, the Romans had managed to subdue a portion of southern Gaul into the province of Gallia Narbonensis and made the Celtic Federation of Noricum into their client state. As the Latins crept north, so too did the Germans begin marching south. Around 120 BC, Either crippling floods or freezing in the southern Jutland Peninsula compelled the Cimbri and Teutonese tribes to begin a mass migration, sending 200,000 warriors along with their families barreling into Norica. Thus the Roman and Germanic worlds met for the first time, and this was almost immediately defined by bloodshed. We have covered the Cimbrian War in a previous video, so we won't go into detail here. In summary, the Cimbrian War. I don't think I've done the Cimbrian War. It sounds interesting because that, that because this time period is like basically right before you know I start my Caesar series because obviously like fifty years later we get to follow Caesar and everything. So the Cimbrian War. I'm gonna give me you guys can remind me in the comments uh, to check out the Cimbrian War because that I, I'd really kind of like to, to see that kind of help kind of connect a lot of this together. The Romans were able to win a Pyrrhic victory at the cost of tens of thousands of lives and received a wake-up call to the true ferocity of their new foe. The next major clash between these two civilizations began sometime in the 60s BC, when one King Ariovistus of the Suebi crossed into Eastern Gaul with an army of 15,000 warriors. Originally there to help the Celtic Sequani tribe fight their Edui rivals, the Swabian leader became enamoured with the fertile lands he had arrived in, turning on his Gallic allies and seizing their realm for himself. Meanwhile, Roman governor Gaius Julius Caesar was at the height of his ambition. Hot off the tales of subduing the migrating Helvetii tribe, he turned his attention to Ariovistus. While the Germanic king was originally labelled a friend of Rome, both he and Caesar lusted for the spoils of war, and in 58 BC, they clashed at the Battle of Voskis in a struggle for dominance over Eastern Gaul. And you guys definitely have to check out my Caesar series if you haven't yet. That, that's awesome. It is really cool. You get, you get like insight on all the battles and how Caesar slowly takes over. Uh, 
the north here and as he you know kind of try gains momentum to kind of take over the republic you know because caesar goes into him goes into the civil war it, you know he doesn't really it doesn't start with caesar as the caesar we know it starts him as just you know one of the leaders of the republic and it just starts his life all all the season the season go the series goes all the way through until he actually dies until his you know assassination so it's definitely a great long series to kind of get into and yeah definitely check that stuff out if you if you enjoyed this kind of content right here and you haven't seen that series definitely check it out anyways they clashed at the Battle of Voskis in a struggle for dominance over Eastern Gaul. Caesar won a decisive victory and continued the conquest of Gaul, culminating at the Siege of Alessia in 52 BC. With this, the Roman border was moved right up to the Rhine River. All of a sudden, the tribes of Germania looked westward and saw not squabbling Gallic tribes, but the strongest army in the ancient world professional and unyielding. The death of the Republic and birth of the Principate coincided with a new era in Roman-Germanic relations. When the first emperor, Augustus, came to power, he extended Rome's territory up to the Danube River. Thus a direct frontier between Rome and Germania was established along the key rivers of the Rhine and Danube, a frontier that would remain more or less deadlocked for centuries. In the following years, back and forth struggle continued. In 16 BC, the emperor's stepsons Tiberius and Drusus launched an invasion into the Alps east of the Rhine, subduing many tribes. The Germanic peoples never gave up an inch of land without a fight, and that same year, the Tencteri, Usipetes, and Sugambri inflicted a crushing defeat upon the 5th legion, Gallia, on the banks of the Lower Rhine. Tiberius pushed back, and according to Roman sources, had managed to subdue the whole of Germania into an obedient province by 6 BC. This would last a grand total of 15 years, before the Cherusci prince Arminius pulled off a devastating ambush on three Roman legions, led by Publius Quinctilius Varus, at Teutoburg Forest in 9 AD. So absolutely crushing was this defeat, that many historians consider it the worst military disaster in Roman history. Following this, Rome retreated from Germania and gave up on ever trying to directly rule the region. The there you go, the TV series stuff right there. The reason Arminius was able to defeat the Empire was in part due to his background. Born as the son of a Germanic chieftain, he had been sent to Rome as a hostage and served in the Imperial military learning all there was to know about Roman tactics and military doctrine. While Arminius would eventually return to his roots and become Rome's principal nightmare, he was one of many Germanic peoples who had spent their life cooperating with the Empire. His life was a testament to the fact that as much as the Romano-Germanic story was defined by war, so too was it defined by diplomacy, trade, and cultural integration. The principal means by which yeah that's right that's a tv show there in a nutshell man they were apparently the tv like i wasn't sure how you know accurate the tv show but a lot of these facts right here definitely happened in the tv show so i'll definitely check that out on netflix i know i've said it like three times but great i'll probably say it again but great show check it out man i mean i'd be excited for you guys to watch that show rome maintained diplomacy with their warlike neighbors was a policy of divide and control. As we covered earlier, the Germanic peoples were locked in inter-tribal struggles, and yep. as a result, the Romans were often able to use hostages, bribes, and alliances with specific tribes to keep the spears of Germania pointed at each other rather than at Rome. Many Germanic peoples soon realized that doing business with Rome was far more profitable than making war on them. Between the 1st and 3rd centuries AD, trade between the two cultures boomed, concentrated at border forts along the Rhine and Danube frontier. Thousands upon thousands of Roman artifacts have been found across Germany, Denmark, Sweden and Eastern Europe, including Campanian pottery, bronze vessels and dining ware of silver and glass. In turn, 
the ancient Germans dealt in animal hides and furs, but their most valuable products lay in amber and slaves, usually captives from rival tribes. Huh. For decades, relative stability prevailed along the Rhine and Danube frontiers, and although both Rome and the Germanic peoples would occasionally challenge one another, no major wars were fought between them. This changed in 166 AD, when a massive confederation of tribes, led by the Marcomanni, attempted a mass southwards migration into the Roman Empire. Naturally, Emperor Marcus Aurelius could not allow this, and as a result, spent 14 years fighting in the brutal slugfest that was the Marcomannic Wars. Marcus Aurelius, that's right, that's from, uh, I don't know if you guys watched the movie Gladiator, isn't that the, the leader of the, isn't that, wasn't that the, you know, the emperor from Gladiator, Marcus Aurelius? And then, you know, obviously, if you watch the TV show, you know what happens next. But so he was a pretty cool, pretty really good leader then, right? I have no idea how accurate a Gladiator was, but anyways. Once more, Rome prevailed, but there was something they had not considered. What could have prompted such a massive confederation of people to uproot themselves to leave their homeland in the first place. Today, most historians agree that they were being pushed out, assailed from the east by a mysterious foe they feared more than they feared Rome. Indeed, as the second century transitioned into the third, new confederations were forming in the heartland of Germania, stronger, larger and fiercer than any who had come before them they would set in motion the next chapter in the struggle between the Roman and Germanic worlds, bringing the empire to its knees and reshaping the entire history of Europe in the process. Join us next time as we continue our history of the ancient Germanic peoples by covering the rise of the great conquerors, the Goths and the Franks. Make sure you are subscribed to our channel oh, and saying. have pressed the bell button. Please consider liking... I didn't realize this was, I guess, I didn't realize this was, I guess, part of a, some kind of series or whatnot, but very cool stuff. Very cool. So I have no idea where I'm going to go with that. I might just go to something very different completely after this uh, video. I'm, I'm not sure. Or I might stick around to kind of connect some more dots here. I'm not sure. Uh, but anyways, guys, let me know. You Please hit the like and subscribe button. Uh, definitely very, very cool stuff. Uh, and it's kind of because you always get to follow the Romans, you know, and and it's kind of it's cool to get to see the the other side, uh, you know, of the story, you know, where the barbarians, Germanic people come from, and their kind of point of views on things, you know, because I don't know, it, it always end up, uh, like I said, the barbarians, it always, you know, history seems to always depict the Romans as the good guys, right? Because you know, I guess because how much they conquered and everything, and just the barbarians as you know these wild you know people or whatnot and uh man they were just trying to live life you know just like anybody else i mean except you know their their lands were being taken over by the romans you know and they didn't yeah <laughs> they're just regular people they're not bad people at all they just you know they weren't as as tight they didn't have the organization like rome did to really you know fight back or really, you know, conquer a lot of stuff or whatnot. But anyways, yeah, very cool stuff. Definitely take a check out the TV show, like I said. And yeah, hit the like and subscribe button. And I'll catch you guys in future videos. Peace, really cool stuff. I'm out.